I want to uh, thank uh, Downtown Madison for inviting me and being patient with me over the six months to, to make this happen. I also uh, want to thank the mayor uh, for being here, the deputy mayors for being here, and all, I, I'm told, 320 alders. Um, <laughs> so there's that. Um, I also want to thank all of you for showing up tonight. This is also a, a, sometimes a tough topic uh, to, to, to talk about in rooms like this. But uh, for me, I don't care. So I'm going to talk to all of you the way that I talk to everyone. Uh, so, so that's how we'll do this. But I also want to thank you for coming after work. Um, you know, these are also long days. And, and I'm from New Orleans, so I presume that this is one of the coldest days of the year for you. Um, so. Not sure. Uh, but I also want to thank you for coming after such a, a, a bad loss this weekend. I know Wisconsin had a, a really tough one. I went to the, I know, I know, get over it. it, it like, it, we're going we're gonna to work through it. <laughs> I went to the Ohio State University. Uh, um, I, I want to get this out at the top just so that you can feel better about me at the end. Um, <laughs> I also met, just as a sidebar, I met another Brian Lee today, so I'm not sure if I'm the Brian Lee you were looking for, but I'm the one you have. Uh, so here we go. Um, lastly, before I get into the, the talk, uh, I want to say that you know, no one person does anything. Uh, a lot of those accolades that you, you, you heard there are not about me. Um, they are about the teams that I've had the opportunity to work with over time. Um, the ancestors uh, that, that came before me, the elders, uh, my comrades, two of which are here today, Mike Ford and Rafiq Assad, uh, both who I, I've known for you know, 20, 20 plus years or 20 years or so. Um, you know, we are a part of an organization called the National Organization of Minority Architects. There is a Wisconsin chapter here, uh, and there's a fantastic project that Rafiq is working on, um, the uh, African American Cultural Center as well. So check, check them out. Um, I say this because, you know, again, None of this happens singularly, and we have to understand our history. That history that I've had with them, uh, that I've had with my staff, that I've had in the city of New Orleans, um, that shapes who I am. And my tongue, my language is a little bit different. Uh, it may hit your ears a little different. My stories are often unfamiliar, um, and the culture that I, I, I am is often denied. And so in these moments where all of these things get a chance to align and I'm in a room that is uh, speaking to power, uh, that's what I'm just here to do. I am here to speak truth to power, always, all the time. So that's what this presentation is about, Power in Place. Uh, I hope you enjoy and we'll, we'll talk through it from there. Uh, our job, uh, again, my, my, my practice is called co-locate and it's colloquial location, right? The sophisticatedly informal use of formal precedent uh, and the specific location or of a place. And so the more we understand the specific nuances of language, and I mean that metaphorically and specifically, uh, the better off we will be, specifically when we're talking about uh, design. And so for us, we talk about the beauty in the definition of co-locate, which is uh, words and phrases habitually juxtaposed at a higher frequency and chance. And so our job as a design practice is to think about the way in which people and places are habitually juxtaposed at a higher frequency than chance. And so when oppression uh, and injustice are embedded into our physical environment, as we spoke about, as many people spoke about a little bit earlier, um, when those things are, are institutionalized into our physical spaces, uh, that bias gets taken off of our own shoulders and put into the buildings. The buildings shape the way we uh, engage our cities, and we don't have to sit with that, that bias anymore. We allow our physical spaces to hold it and tell people whether or not their value is, is affirmed. Yeah? So we live by this one kind of certain creed which is that for nearly every injustice in this world, there is an architecture uh, that sustains it. Our collective values are validated through the spaces and places that we design and the ways in which we challenge uh, those spaces, uh, the, the people, the places, the, the systems around um, those spaces allow us to move forward with a lens towards equity and a lens towards justice. So this is what our practice does. Uh, we forward the efforts of racial, social, and cultural reparation uh, through processes uh, and outcomes of design. And that means that we challenge the privilege and power structures that use architecture and design as a means to perpetuate that injustice throughout the physical environment. And so that means that we have to then challenge those existing power structures, amplify existing uh, expertise. And when, when I say, I often pause here for a second, when we say amplify existing expertise, we often uh, mean that 
we're looking for the Miss Marys on the block. We're talking about the people who, who have been on a block for 50 years and know how every crack happened. They can tell you who grew up where, what's, uh, who grew up where, what schools they went to. Those stories are equally as important as all of the expertise in this room. Yes, and so the more that we are able to find and value those voices, the better off again our communities will be. We build collective power through these relationships uh, in community, and we acknowledge the fact that neighborhood is not the same as community. The geographic boundaries of neighborhood are different than the tenuous kind of connections that community hold to a geographic space, which means that any time when we are designing in space, we can shift and move those communities very easily if we're not careful. Yeah? We lift the stories of place. We attempt not to bury those stories as often as possible. And we envision spaces that serve the marginalized first. Those who have been impacted and marginalized, disinherited from the, the, the course of city building for so long, we allow them to have voice primarily. So that language, I start with this, this idea that the language I speak, I said a little bit, bit earlier that the language I speak, the tongue may, may be a little bit different. The stories may, may be a little bit off. Um, the culture that I, that I have may be a little bit different than what you, you are used to. Uh, but all of these things are important when we're talking about shaping cities and when we're talking about shaping equitable and just spaces. And so I want to start with a little bit of history because these stories don't start today. Uh, they've been uh, moving in perpetuity for so long. So I started this little moment before planning uh, really got off its feet. At the, at the start of planning in the comp, at a conference in New York, uh, there was this conversation around what planning wanted to be. Was it going to be centered on the architecture, on the physicality of space, or was it going to be focused on the social conditions, the, the people in that place? What is the nature of our soul? That was the question. And it had these three options. Can we be architects, or can we associate ourselves with architecture, social workers, or public health? The answer meant that they went to, towards architecture, but uh, it could have went a different way. I'm going to go ahead and give you that real quick. Go ahead. There you go. <laughs> it could have went a different way. You've got to be quick with it, though. I've got to hit my marks. Uh, yes. Uh, so it could have went a different way. Uh, <laughs> The Philadelphia Negro was a project uh, by W.B. Du Bois in uh, 1898. And this is really one of the first large scale um, social work um, kind of explorations of what life was like for black people in uh, Philadelphia in the Seventh Ward specifically. And I, I bring this up primarily because uh, this is the intersection of the physical environment uh, and the, the kind of social work and the social lives of people in this particular place. W.B. Du Bois went and, and met with over 10,000 people, knocked on doors, went and looked at conditions. And we don't do that. We don't do those things anymore. Uh, the ability to, to, to go in and understand the conditions of people, what they did for a living, and how they uh, experienced their lived environment was all wrapped up in this book. So if you ever get a chance, check it out. But the idea is simply this. If we take the time to get to know the, place, the people and places uh, that we are building and creating with, uh, again, the better off our communities will be. I spent some time in Philadelphia. I'm, I'm a military brat, so I am, I'm from everywhere and nowhere. But my home is, is, is really Trenton, New Jersey. Uh, my grandmother is from Philadelphia in the Seventh Ward. And uh, one of the things that I, I, I took uh, when I went to a site visit um, in, in Philadelphia was that one of the officers had spent 15 years working in this ward. He had never done a community meeting. He had never been out uh, to understand the people to which he was patrolling. How can you? How can you exist in an environment for that long and not know the people uh, that are supposed to be uh, in your commune? Yeah. So on the other hand, um, the uh, contrary to W.B. Du Bois uh, was Booker T. Washington. And Booker T. Washington really collectively worked on a couple projects that I'll, I'll talk about here. But one was this effort in 1881 all the way through the early 1920s um, to cultivate a space for uh, black uh, uh, youth to come into a program like Tus Tuskegee Institute 
and learn how to be architects, contractors, and be community members. Uh, what they did over the course of about 10 years was build over 50 plus buildings on uh, Tuskegee's campus. Uh, it, it went from 10 uh, acres of land to over 100 acres of land. And what they did was teach people to not just be designers, not just to think about uh, the physical space, but to think about the human beings that, that exist within it. Now, what that led to was a effort, a massive effort in 1917 to 1935, uh, 1932, uh, that built over 5,300 schools across the South called the Rosenwald Schools. Now these Rosenwald Schools were specifically for marginalized communities that did not have access to education, specifically black people in the South. Now, there are so many people that I sit and meet in the South now that acknowledge and know this story, know these spaces, but don't know the story behind them. And so our job often is to, to lift those and make sure that the 10% of these buildings that are still left uh, stand. So there's a historic preservation component of this as well, not just a cultural preservation component. The last person I'll talk about before we, we move into the work is really uh, W, I'm sorry, um, Whitney M. Young. So Whitney M. Young gave a speech to the American Institute of Architects in 1968 at a Portland, Oregon. Now this converse, uh, conversation, he said the architectural profession has been both thunderously silent and completely irrelevant. Yeah, I know, it hurts. Um, it is one of those statements that rings to, to, to so many architects uh, consistently. How are we being complicit to systems of injustice? And he spoke that truth to power uh, in that space. Now that was a byproduct of uh, the Kerner Report. He was one of the members who, uh, in, in the uh, late 1960s, 1967, got a chance to walk around after the riots uh, from 64 to 67 to acknowledge and understand the breadth of the riots uh, that happened across the country. One of the things that Lyndon B. Johnson did during that time was to try to find the outside agita agitators, as he called them. He just wanted to find the people that he could point the finger to. The report said something completely different. It pointed to the systems of injustice uh, that were pe perpetrated against so uh, many people who are disenf disenfranchised in their environment. Now, I link these because it's not just about uh, the ways in which architecture exists in the world. It's an acknowledgement of business leaders' uh, role in this. It's an acknowledgement of uh, political power's role in sustaining these systems, yeah? So it's not just us as architects. I know if this was a room of architects, we would you know, have a different, different conversation, but this is to you. This is to you all who are in this room. You have not just an obligation, uh, but the opportunity the opportunity to serve so many people if we open our, our eyes to do something a little bit better. Um, and so what does it mean to look at those spaces? All of these spaces that we build are not always going to be consistently yelling at us the prejudice and biases that are ingrained into our systems. Uh, but I often show this image, this, this uh, image on the right-hand side of um, Gordon Park's image of a young woman and her sister in the 1950s, 1954 in Alabama at a uh, convenience store, um, as well as uh, uh, desegregation in the South in Alabama as well. Um, these two images set, tell us the same thing. You are, do not belong here. So how do we acknowledge those things? They do not always say the same thing anymore. We're not gonna have colored entrance signs, but our spaces will still tell us about our value those spaces, those cultural spaces, uh, define and tell us uh, how we can, can create revolution in these spaces. Um, and that often happens in our public spaces, whether that's parks, as we saw today, uh, the amount of change that they can have in a community, um, or buses, or our civic um, uh, facilities. So to ground you, I wanted to give you a couple of these questions that I carry with me every single day. Uh, in our work, our employees, our staff, we have to recite this when they come in the door every morning. They don't, but um, what, what are the power structures uh, that exist in a particular community? Uh, who holds that power? What are the resulting injustices that exist? Uh, who is directly and disproportionately impacted? Who are the marginalized? Who are the disinherited? Uh, how uh, does the built environment 
hold on to those biases? How do they manifest or facilitate injustice? And then lastly, again, what are the opportunities to imagine new spaces, new systems, new models that address systems of injustice uh, more pervasively? And it means that we have to understand the ecosystem of power. We have to understand the institutions and how those institutions relate back to what we do and how we build in our cities. It means that the pedagogy, the policies and procedures, uh, as we call the signal in this work, uh, relate to the receiver, the practice, the projects, and the people. The ways in which the policies that we set in planning and city commissions uh, relate back to architecture firms that have to respond or developers who have to respond to financial institutions, so on and so forth. So all of these things are a cyclical system that we have to understand in totality. And so I say that to say, uh, again, I'll walk you through some of these stories and see if you can spot some of the, the ways in which we've done that. This is, uh, again, a map of the Rosenwald schools I mentioned a little bit earlier. Uh, one of the reasons that I, I bring this back up is really that uh, in this moment you saw, again, 5,300 schools built across the South. But what's valuable about this is that it was a whole community effort. Communities raised money philanthropic uh, institutions uh, donated dollars to these schools, and the government, uh, the local governments, the federal governments provided some money uh, for these things to, to happen. And so over the course of 15 years, you saw a massive, massive push for justice in education through these physical spaces, not just through these physical spaces, but they served as uh, education spaces and community spaces. They served to hold the, uh, the knitting of community together uh, writ large. And so we look at some of those other stories that have happened over that time. The African American Museum started as a small plea by museum organizers back in 1916, and it took 100 years. I show this because I think oftentimes we, we are impatient with ourselves and with the work that we're able to do. And I know that the political cycles often force us to be a little impatient, um, but it takes time, it takes persistence. We can't give up, we have to continue to push. The Architectural Renew Committee, we have to stand. I show this because uh, those who have the power, the knowledge, the expertise, um, this is Max Bond who uh, helped lead the Architectural Renew Renewal Committee of Harlem in the face of gentrification back in the 60s uh, in Harlem. And, and warded it off for a really long time now. If you've been to Harlem recently, you know that it got hit eventually. Uh, but ultimately, you're talking about a group of people who didn't have to do any of this, but they chose to stand anyway. And I always mention the Black Panthers. The Black Panthers who are often maligned for the work that they did, uh, but they showed us a model for human rights that accepted and acknowledged um, uh, young people and their knowledge of, of community and culture. They fed people consistently. Uh, they provided food for people. And they started, uh, if, if, if anybody knows what the WIC program is, that was institutionalized through, or that was taken from the Black Panthers. Right? So anyway. Just a little tidbit there. Uh, and then I mentioned uh, the Claiborne Avenue design team out of New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, which fought one of the larger uh, institutionalized modes of bias and prejudice that happened across the country uh, throughout the 50s and 60s, which is the Highways Act that, that put uh, thousands and thousands of miles uh, through specifically black and brown neighborhoods uh, through the 50s and 60s here in this country. Uh, this Claiborne Avenue design team, again, uh, we stand on the shoulders of our ancestors and our elders. Uh, this is a project that uh, try to envision what it meant to reclaim a space that cut through a historically African-American neighborhood. Now this neighborhood, uh, thousands of people who spent all of their time, uh, a lot of their time in these neutral grounds. These neutral grounds are basically giant public parks. Um, so all of their communal time was spent underneath 400 live oak trees uh, with grills and stores on either side of, the, of this, this, this giant set of parks. Uh, 397 businesses, um, 340 of them closed after the highway came about. Um, health indicators went down, uh, educational indicators went down, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, but they, in, they imposed and put forward a vision in 1974 that has resonance today in New Orleans. So I want to show you So in that neighborhood, 
there's a project that we worked on called uh, Blights Out. And it was really around vacancy in New Orleans. After the storm, before the storm, we had about 25,000, sorry. Before the storm, we had about 25,000 uh, vacant properties. After the storm, we had about 50,000. We're down to about 40 in this moment. And part of it is that we have Napoleonic law, which means we can't get properties back onto, uh, in, into commerce unless we track down every resident or uh, deed holder. It meant that we had to untangle a system that stopped us from being able to put houses back into commission. We have a 30,000 uh, uh, unit deficit in our affordable housing in the city that matches specifically with the amount of affordable, uh, uh, unused housing or vacancy that we currently have. And so for us, architecture didn't mean in this particular project that we had to go out and design a building. It meant that we had to untangle systems. We had to clarify what those systems meant so that we can actually uh, design something that worked better for, for our city, not just for our developers, but for our city. It meant that we had to expose some of those, those biases and those laws. We had to acknowledge some of the language we use. Um, we had to talk about what disaster capitalism looked like in our city and the impacts of that. And we had to pinpoint that the Louisiana Constitution um, to make sure that we understood exactly, precisely, where these things uh, were, were held. And so we did this in the mayoral campaign. So we ran for mayor, sorry, um, in New Orleans. And we actually started to use this as our campaign. Again, power resides in those rituals that we create. So one of the projects that uh, I often uh, point to is a recent project called Paper Monuments. Um, we talk about form follows fiction oftentimes. The, the, the standard quote is form follows function, but I believe that our stories, our narratives, uh, the ways in which they are embedded into our space tell so much more about who we are and how we're going to move forward. I, I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a project called Paper Monuments, which took that narrative to task. We uh, did a citywide planning process that asked thousands of New Orleans residents what it meant to hear the stories and to see themselves in physical space. We collected those stories, we made newspapers and shipped them back out to, to all of our residents. Uh, we collected stories from academics and storytellers on a block. We connected those people with artists and we plastered those things across the city. Um, we made posters that ended up uh, at the African American Museum and told the story of our community beyond just uh, the plaques that we often get, which are 250 words of a historical moment. We extend beyond uh, those stories and visualize uh, what it might mean for us to, to exist beyond that day. We took those stories of our entire community and tried to rationalize those by envisioning what it might look like for them to be uh, placed uh, in context in our city. This is one about stolen spirits. There were thousands of, of uh, enslaved Africans who were dropped on the shores of New Orleans. Uh, what would it look like for us to actually envision them not as enslaved individuals, but as uh, the, the professionals, the human beings that they were? We talked about the flowers. We talked about removing um, the, the, the column that's in the center of our city that held uh, Robert E. Lee. Uh, which is a Confederate uh, general who spent no time in New Orleans. Uh, and this was the highest point in our city for a significant amount of time. You see, all of that for us, culture, tells us that culture is important. If we don't recognize it, it will be lost forever. And the culture that gets a chance to speak itself into existence in our physical environment uh, tells the long-term story. We often saw ourselves as the kind of time travelers that, that go back and try to protect the timeline. Uh, we ask ourselves, is this space and place that we exist in today reflective of the stories, the narratives, the people who fought um, for us moving forward? Um, and if it's not, how do we rectify that? You see, for us, culture is evolution. Culture is absolutely revolution. Last project I'll show you is a project called the Claiborne Avenue um, design uh, space. And the Claiborne Innovation District uh, was a space underneath that highway that I mentioned a little bit earlier. Again, literally 19 blocks uh, decimated this, this neighborhood, the oldest African-American neighborhood in the entire country, um, decimated it. 
and for 50 years, uh, we've had to deal with the ramifications of that. But people do that. They actually find ways to heal. When you have a scar, that scar heals up, and often you learn how to live with it. Um, but about uh, t 10 years ago, after the storm, we started to ask ourselves the question. We pulled up that document uh, from our ancestors, from our elders, that asked us, what would it look like for us to reclaim this space uh, for the community? And so we took that as um, an honorific to make sure that we could move forward uh, with that voice in the back of our heads as we approach this project uh, as a 19 block community business space underneath the corridor. And so we asked the question to thousands of residents uh, in the Treme who came out and gave their voice, what was past in this space? What is present in this space? And what is the future that you wanna see in this space? It meant that we asked questions to our business leaders, to our artists, to our young people, uh, and we gave them a space for their voice to not just be heard, but to be implemented uh, in strategy. We took those conversations and rendered them. We talked to people about them, and we showed them uh, what their voice interpreted uh, into design looked like. We made sure that our culture was reflective uh, of, of the music, the food, the dance, the clothing, all of those things uh, found space. We made sure that, again, our ancestors were, um, were reflected. These are a set of, of uh, monuments, essentially, uh, to those who had, who had fallen over time. And over the course of this, one of the major things that I'll, I'll leave you with before I close out here is that we ended up with all of these stories and all of the narratives that came through our, our shop. We understood that there was a very specific cultural uh, condition that we needed to, to, to connect to. And that was really that in our community, uh, we had a entire group of people, specifically black and brown businesses that were 95% of them were one to three people throughout the entirety of their existence. And what that meant was that we couldn't put them back in spaces that were just white walls, that were gonna have rent increases and tax increases year over year. We actually had to design a, a different set of things, specifically because those businesses were going to operate an entirely different way. It's listening for the language of the street. It's hearing the stories of the people. It's making sure that we respect the culture uh, that exists. And so I'll leave you with this last little set of words. The language that we speak is important. The architecture, architecture is a language, and architecture, like all languages, allows us to tell a story. The stories that we tell are important. The buildings tell our story, and diverse stories come di from diverse cultures. Culture ultimately is end all be all. It is important, and culture is the consequence of persistent circumstance and immediate conditions. In our cities, in our neighborhoods, and our blocks incubate that culture, and specifically for disinherited communities, marginalized communities in America. There is power in the places and spaces where our culture is recognized, where our stories are told, and where our language is valued, because that is not only good design, that is justice. Thank you.